Hi there, and thank you so much for taking this course. We're now going to go ahead and get into another analysis of Section 3 of the IELTS listening exam. So this one is coming from book number 7, and it's test 3, section 3 from book number 7. As you know, I use books 7 to 14 when teaching this course. I like to give a mixture because there are many, there are some question types that you only will see in the older books, 7, 8, 9, and 10, and those question types actually appear on the real exam. And so you want to be aware of every different type of question that you might see on the IELTS listening exam. So now we're in book number seven, and we're test three, section three. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, first of all, we have a fill the blank question. And with fill the blank questions, we always want to be aware of the language that is before and after the blank line. So for 21, I'm listening for language that means the same as shaped like. From 22, I'm trying to hear about where the scientists are from. I'm listening for that language. Now, this one is interesting because what we're dealing with here with this one is that we have a diagram in section three. And most of the time, you'll see a diagram in section two, but that's not the same as what you have right here. This is just a diagram. In section two, they have a map where you have to follow it. But here, it's still a fill the blank question but they're just presenting it, they're presenting it within a diagram format. And so it's very similar to the diagram question that you see for the IELTS reading test. It's the same principle. It's a fill the blank question within a diagram. But for number 23, we're gonna be listening for um, if, if the float dropped into the ocean and blank by satellite. I'm listening for that language. Something happened by satellite. 24, we're listening for the average distance. I can already predict there, they're probably gonna give us more than one number. Whenever you're dealing with an answer or a question that requires a number, you can expect them to give you more than one number. Number 25 is gonna come after they mention something about the salinity of the water or changes in sal salinity of the water. And then we close it out by a multiple choice question where you have to choose the correct answer choice from the box. So here we're dealing with at present, in the near future, and long-term future. So we know these questions are gonna go in order and they're gonna give us synonyms for the correct answer choice. So when they give us, when they talk about understanding El Nino, they're not gonna say exactly at present or in the near future or long-term future. They're going to paraphrase the correct answer choice of A, B, or C. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and do my test right now. You should go ahead and pull out your book number seven and do your test on your own, and then you can come back and check your answers against mine. But I'm going to go ahead and do my test right now, and you can see me go through my answering process and I'll go ahead also and point out for you the tricks and traps that they're doing on the exam to try to disguise when the answer is being said. So let's get started. Thanks to all of you for coming along today to hear about how the robotic float project is helping with ocean research. Well, first of all, we'll look at what a robotic float does and its use. So let's start with the device itself. It looks a bit like a cigar, and it's about one and a half meters long. More importantly, it's full of equipment that's designed to collect data. So it can help us in building up a profile of different factors which work together within the world's oceans. Sounds like a big project. Isn't it too big for one country to undertake? That's quite true, but this project is a really good example of international cooperation. Over the last five years, scientists from 13 countries have been taking part in the project and launching floats in their area of ocean control.
And next year, this number will rise to 14 when Indonesia joins the project. That's impressive. But let's move on to how floats work. The operational cycle goes like this. Each of the floats is dropped in the ocean from a boat at a set point and activated from a satellite. Then the float immediately sinks about 2,000 metres. That's two whole kilometres down in the water. It stays at this depth for about 10 days and is carried around by the currents which operate in the ocean at this level. During this time, it's possible for it to cover quite large distances, but the average is 50 kilometres. So, what is it actually recording? Well, at this stage, nothing. But as it rises to the surface, it collects all sorts of data. Most importantly, variations in salinity, that's salt levels, and the changes in temperature, a bit like underwater weather balloons. Then, when it gets back to the surface, all the data it's collected is beamed up to the satellite. After about five hours on the surface, the float automatically sinks, beginning the whole process again. What happens to the data? Well, the information is transferred direct to onshore meteorological stations, like our one in Hobart, and within four hours the findings can be on computers, and they can be mapped and analysed. Before you hear the rest of the seminar, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. You say you're building models of the world's ocean systems, but how are they going to be used? And more importantly, when? Some of the data has already helped in completing projects. For example, our understanding of the underlying causes of El Nino events is being confirmed by float data. Another way we're using float data is to help us to understand the mechanics of climate change, like global warming and ozone depletion. That's part of an ongoing variability study, but the results are still a long way off. However, this is not the case with our ocean weather forecasting. Because we know from the floats what the prevailing weather conditions will be in certain parts of the ocean, we can advise the Navy on search and rescue missions. That's happening right now, and many yachtsmen owe their lives to the success of this project. In addition, the float data can help us to look at the biological implications of ocean processes. Would that help with preserving fish stocks? Yes, and advising governments on fisheries legislation. We're well on the way to completing a project on this. We hope it will help to bring about more sustainable fishing practices. We'll be seeing the results of that quite soon. It sounds like the data from floats has lots of applications. Yes, it does. It's also a powerful agricultural tool. If we were aware of what the weather would be like, say, uh, next year, we could make sure that the farmers planted appropriate grain varieties to produce the best yield from the available rainfall. That sounds a bit like science fiction, <laughs> especially when now we can't even tell them when a drought will break. I agree that this concept is still a long way in the future. But it will come eventually, and the float data will have made a contribution. Okay, so let's go ahead and go through the answer choices now. With this one, I'm going to go ahead and go through it question by question, doing a question by question analysis. Sometimes I do a question by question, and other times I'll just play it again and let you listen to the uh, listen for the answer choices with the traps and tricks pointed out to you already. But this time, we're going to go ahead and go through it question by question. So, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks to all of you for coming along today to hear about how the robotic float project is helping with ocean research. Well, first of all, we'll look at what a robotic float does and its use. So, let's start with the device itself. It looks a bit like a cigar, and it's about one and a half meters long. More... All right, so right there they told us that it looks a bit like a cigar. So looks a bit like is synonym for shaped like, so the answer is cigar. 
Now, you might not hear the word cigar that often, so it's a word that could be tricky to spell, but it's C-I-G-A-R, and it must be spelled exactly like that. Importantly, it's full of equipment that's designed to collect data, so it can help us in building up a profile of different factors which work together within the world's oceans. Sounds like a big project. Isn't it too big for one country to undertake? That's quite true, but this project is a really good example of international cooperation. Over the last five years, scientists from 13 countries have been taking part in the project and launching floats in their area of ocean control. And next year, this number will rise to 14 when... All right, and so here, what we're dealing with is you're dealing with the situation where they are really trying to see, do you know the difference between 13 and 30? Can you tell the difference between 13 and 30? Now they mentioned the word 14, but that was related to next year, not dealing with scientists from 13 countries have worked, which means they have done it already. They have been working on it. But the number 14 cannot be the answer. But the real trick here is can the student tell the difference between the word 13 and the word 30? Indonesia joins the project. That's impressive. But let's move on to how floats work. The operational cycle goes like this. Each of the floats is dropped in the ocean from a boat at a set point and activated from a satellite. We heard that one very directly and activated from a satellite. Right, from a satellite, by a satellite. Then the float immediately sinks about 2,000 meters. That's two whole kilometers down in the water. It stays at this depth for about 10 days and is carried around by the currents which operate in the ocean at this level. During this time, it's possible for it to cover quite large distances, but the average is 50 kilometers. So the average is 50 kilometers. Now, how did they try to trick you there? They gave several numbers. You heard 2,000 kilometers. You heard two, uh, two kilometers. You heard uh, the number two, right? You heard several numbers, but the only number attached to the word average was 50, 50 kilometers. Now, you could just write here KM. If you spelled out kilometer, kilometers, that's fine also. So... What is it actually recording? Well, at this stage, nothing. But as it rises to the surface, it collects all sorts of data. Most importantly, variations in salinity, that's salt levels, and the changes in temperature. A bit. So, variations in salinity, and then they mention changes in temperature. So here, the real challenge is, can you spell the word temperature? Sometimes, an answer to a question, they don't try to really hide the answer because really the word they're giving you is more about your ability to spell the word. So sometimes they don't make it difficult to hear the answer because they're challenge, challenging you on the spelling aspect of it. Like underwater weather balloons. Then when it gets back to the surface, all the data is collected is beamed up to the satellite. After about five hours on the surface, the float automatically sinks, beginning the whole process again. What happens to the data? Well, the information is transferred direct to onshore meteorological stations, like our one in Hobart, and within four hours the findings can be on computers, and they can be mapped and analysed. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. You say you're building models of the world's ocean systems, but how are they going to be used? And more importantly, when? Some of the data has already helped in completing projects. For example, our understanding of the underlying causes of El Nino events is being confirmed by float data. So they said El Nino is being confirmed. That means right now, at present. 
Another way we're using float data is to help us to understand the mechanics of climate change, like global warming and ozone depletion. That's part of an ongoing variability study, but the results are still a long way off. Results are a long way off. What is that a paraphrase for? In the long-term future. Choice C. However, this is not the case with our ocean weather forecasting. Because we know from the floats what the prevailing weather conditions will be in certain parts of the ocean, we can advise the Navy on search and rescue missions. That's happening right now. And many yachts... That's happening right now. That means what? At present. Choice A. So you can see with these question types, it's all about listening for paraphrasing. ...men owe their lives to the success of this project. In addition, the float data can help us to look at the biological implications of ocean processes. Would that help with preserving fish stocks? Yes, and advising governments on fisheries legislation. We're well on the way to completing a project on this. We hope it will help to bring about more sustainable fishing practices. We'll be seeing the results of that quite soon. We'll be seeing the results of that quite soon. That's a paraphrase for in the near future. The answer is B. It sounds like the data from floats has lots of applications. Yes, it does. It's also a powerful agricultural tool. If we were aware of what the weather would be like, say, uh, next year, we could make sure that the farmers planted appropriate grain varieties to produce the best yield from the available rainfall. That sounds a bit like science fiction, <laughs> especially when now we can't even tell them when a drought will break. I agree that this concept is still a long way in the future, but it will... All right, so it's a long way in the future. That is a paraphrase for in the long-term future. Now, let me say this. Those are the answer choices, everybody. A, C, A, B, C. So I want to mention something to you about practicing very quickly. Many, many students don't practice the right way. They just take one test, check the answers for right or wrong, then move to the next test. If you really want to get better, if you really, truly want to get better, you need to break down every listening test the exact same way that you see me doing it right now. Take the test, then go back and write out the synonym and paraphrase language that they're using. Point out the traps that they're using, whether they're using referencing or word reordering or playing around with synonyms. Go back and break down every single listening test you do. Write out these tracks and trips, r r tricks and traps. Write out the way that they are using paraphrasing. Do that, and I promise you, you will get better. That's how you improve. Don't just take test, check right or wrong, then jump to another test. That's not going to make you that much better. All right, so thanks so much for joining me today. I hope that you've learned a lot more about how to handle Section 3. Take care.